What was this church raised up for? For prepare people to meet Jesus when he comes back at his second coming. You know, in 1844, there was a man named William Miller. And he went preaching all over this country. And he was trying to wake people up to something that was coming, something that was happening. And they were thinking that it was Jesus' second coming. Right? Yep. October 22nd, 1844. That was the day. You know, the whole world was looking for Jesus' coming. And there was what they call the great disappointment of 1844. Because he didn't come that day, did he? Nope. But we know through Scripture that something happened. And there was a little old farmer upstate New York named Hiram Edson in Orr Crozier. And they took and prayed with a bunch of other people and whipped betterly all night long. And they probably took the back roads because they didn't want people to see them, so they cut through the cornfield. And Hiram Edson, what's he do? He sees the vision. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Can you imagine a disappointment when you just give up everything and you reckon that Jesus is coming at a certain time and he doesn't come? And you've just put it all on the line. You know, that would separate people. And it did. There were some people that never, ever returned to anything that had Jesus' name written. And there was a small group of people. There wasn't an advanced around yet. But there was a small group of people that got together. And they were Methodists. And they were Baptists. And they were Presbyterians. And they dug in. And they dug in. And they studied. And they studied some of these things right here. Like Hebrews 8. Now these things which we have spoken. This sum. Hebrews 8.1 We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. You see, the scriptures they were looking at said that he was coming to cleanse the sanctuary. But they understood the sanctuary to be the earth. And it wasn't the earth. It, what it was talking about was Jesus was moving from the holy place to the most holy place where the ark is found, where judgment happens, where the mercy seat is, the, atonement. the day of atonement. That's exactly what it was. <clears throat> so I, I'm just going to read on through this here a little bit. On verse 3, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifice, wherefore it is a necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example, you hear this, and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, God says, saith, he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to be in the mount. So what was he doing? If he's making something after a pattern, he's trying to copy something, right? There was a sanctuary in heaven, and God built a sanctuary on this earth to represent the sanctuary in heaven to teach us these lessons Amen. of the way of salvation, the whole picture. And the Jewish economy was entrusted with all this beautiful uh, imagery and understanding. 
And they were supposed to take it to the world. But what did they do with it? What did they do with it? They, they became, it became exclusive. Like a woman's cooking recipe that she got from her mother, who got from her mother that she can't share with you because, you know, that's our cooking recipe. It's for us. Are you hearing me? Pride is a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. If we can extinguish pride, sin disappears. It's gone. It's gone. Why do you think Paul was able to do what he did? Because he said what? He was the chief of sinners. Right? So he automatically looked at everybody as better than himself. Is there any pride there? No pride there. No pride there. This is a key to where we want to be. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then there should, have, should no place have been sought for the second. And then verse 8 says, for finding fault with them. Ooh, so the problem was with the people, not the covenant. Are you hearing that? So what is the importance of the Adventist church? Why was this place raised up by all these different denominations? What, what, why are we so different? We have taken all these things that, that these other, we, we have grown on the, the backs of these other de, uh, denominations that, that took points of light. Like the Baptists. The Baptists, their point of light is full immersion baptism, right? Which is truth. It's found in the Bible, right? The Methodists had a way of, you know, prayer and study and fasting. Um, there was Seventh-day Baptists. There's, uh, yeah, let's go there. December 1844, Helen Harmon, okay, at the age of 17, had her very first vision. Her very first vision. And you know why? Because these people were all together and they were discussing all these things and realizing truth and bringing it all into one storehouse instead of having one point of truth for this denomination or one point of truth. Everything that congealed and the Bible taught, they were bringing into one house. One house. And when they come to a stumbling point where they couldn't go any further, Helen, Ellen White would go into vision and God would give her understanding that she didn't have before that at all. She wouldn't even understand what the guys were talking about. But then she would have the vision and it would all come together. Bates. It was Bates. He was this, he was this, um, he was a Seventh-day Baptist guy. Right? And he comes to this group and he shares with them about the Sabbath. And they're trying to take it all in, you know. And this guy, he didn't believe in her visions. He thought, oh, this is, this is a bunch of hooey, right? But this guy was a very seasoned sailor. And he understood astronomy very well, okay? You have to. Back in the day, they didn't have all the instruments we have today to get across the ocean. These were smart guys. You know, we're pretty dumbed down today. <laughs> we are very dumbed down. We are not dumb. I didn't say you were dumb. I said we're dumbed down. Anyways, in one of her visions, Ellen White spoke extensively about astronomy. It's different things that there's just no way this girl could have known. And he began to see that God was using her. You know, and, and God was just continually doing things to, to bring this church. This church has a, a, has a prophetic birthmark, brothers and sisters. Amen. A prophetic birthmark to finish the work of God. There isn't another church coming out. It's, there is, 
there's nothing new under the sun. God, this is it. We've got to get it right. Okay? This is the one that it may look like it's going to talk, but it's going to go through. It's going to go through. God has promised us that. You know, you can study these things right in through Revelation 19 through 22. I encourage you guys to look there and, and check it out. Um, there was a Sunday preacher, Pastor Wheeler, and uh, he was preaching on the Ten Commandments. And there was this little gal, and I remember she had a first name. I can't remember her first name. She had a real interesting first name. We'll call her Mrs. Oaks. She was a Seventh-day Baptist. She was a pretty forward gal. And she went right after this wheeler, right after the sermon, because he's preaching about the Ten Commandments. And she's like, well, you're preaching the Ten Commandments, but here you are a Sunday keeper. Why aren't you keeping the Sabbath? And he was like, lady, you're nuts. But you know what? He sat down, he studied with her. He became a great preacher of truth. Because it, it's, it's truth. You know, when, when Jesus died on the cross... His will and testament cannot be changed. Brothers and sisters, if you have a will, Mary Jane, you have your will. When you die, your will is set. You could change it before you die, but you can't change it after. Do you understand? Jesus' will and testament was ratified at his death. So if there was something that he wanted to change, he would have had to do it before he died. But even more than that, brothers and sisters, if any part of God's law could have been changed in any way, why would Jesus had to have died? Do you hear me? The Ten Commandments stand as firm today as they will for eternity, brothers and sisters. We could go into Acts chapter 2 and we could talk about the upper room experience where Peter came out of there full of the Holy Ghost. Preached a sermon that 3,000 are saved in one day. Think about that. 3,000 men. Men. Yeah, we're not even talking about women and children. So how many? We don't even know. We can't put a number on it. The amazing boldness when they got rid of pride, when pride was extinguished, they saw all people as better than themselves. They went out and turned the world upside down. That's what we need to do, brothers and sisters. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close on 2 Peter. Let's turn to 2 Peter. That little book just before the little books of John. 2 Peter, uh, chapter 1. And I'm going to begin and let's go with 16. Y'all ready? You there? For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Peter. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son. Boy, just letting that roll off your lips. It just falls flat coming from a human, doesn't it? In whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Peter was there. At the Mount of Transfiguration. You hear what he's saying here? He's saying, listen to me. I've heard God's voice. I've seen Jesus. I mean in his glory. And then we go on to verse 19 and it says, We also, it, it's not a but, but it's almost a but. Do you hear it? I mean, it, it's something that's strengthening this. It says, we have also, a more sure, you hear that word? Sure, word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
What is that saying? If that isn't lifting up Scripture and saying Scripture, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, builds God's Word. It's all together about Jesus Christ. And you can't throw out any part of it. Amen. And certainly not the covenant that God made. Correct? There will be a generation, brothers and sisters, that will reveal the victory in Jesus. And what is the victory in Jesus? Can I ask you that question? Is it fair? Overcoming. Overcoming. Isn't that it? Isn't that it? It's overcoming. That's the victory. Jesus overcame. And he said, he said to what? For us to overcome. overcome the same way he did. And how did he do it? By dying to self. That's the answer. Dying to self. He took all his orders from his heavenly father. And lived the victorious life. Brothers and sisters, he didn't just die for you, okay? And live for you. Are you hearing me? He didn't just die for you and live for you. He lived your life. Amen. And he died your death. Amen. Please understand the depth of that. Because a lot of people explain it in a different way. But that's exactly where it's at. Because God only accepts absolute perfection. Okay? And absolute perfection only comes in Jesus Christ. Think of that for a moment. How he walked that walk and never sinned in word, deed, thought, in any way. That's amazing. And he's telling us that we can have that kind of victory if we will latch on and dig in and say, I'm not going to let you go lest you bless me. Right? When we hold on to him that way, we really, really want it. I'm telling you, if there's nothing else that I've ever learned in life, I've learned this. You find what you're looking for. What are you looking for? That brings us back again to the sermon title. What is your focus? It's really a simple message, brothers and sisters. A simple message. Our closing hymn today will be uh, Jesus is Coming Again. Number 213. Can you shut this off for a second there, brother? So I can plug this in and not bring everybody's ear drum. You good? Okay, stand.